Good morning, everybody. And thank you again for taking the time and making the trip, or making the trip on your computer, to be with us here this weekend. It's been almost 10 years now since I gave my first public talk about the Bible and same-sex relationships at a church in my hometown of Wichita, Kansas. Since then, a lot has changed, both good and bad. So today, I'd like to take a step back to take stock of where the LGBTQ conversation in the church is at, some significant challenges that we face, and how we can most faithfully help to steward this conversation in a way that builds up the church rather than undermines it. Ultimately, this conversation isn't just about sexual orientation and gender identity, as important as those things are. It isn't even just about LGBTQ people and our lives and dignity, although it certainly isn't about anything less than that. But part of what makes this such a challenging and often anxiety-inducing conversation, especially for many non-affirming Christians, is that it's also about truth, about morality, about what the Bible teaches, and about what it means to follow Jesus. Sometimes, for those of us who are affirming and who see on a daily basis the horrible toll that non-affirming theology takes on so many LGBTQ people, it can be difficult to extend patience and grace to those in the church who don't also see this topic as an urgent matter of justice and all too often even of life and death. When we share stories of the heartbreaking pain and suffering caused by non-affirming teachings, it can be easy to assume that anyone who isn't moved to reconsider their beliefs as a result must just be a hard-hearted person, if not outright hateful and bigoted. And to be fair, anti-LGBTQ prejudice and even hatred is all too real, both within and outside of the church. Even more common isn't active animus or even hard-heartedness, but simply a failure of empathy an unwillingness to put oneself in the shoes of a gay, bisexual, or transgender person and truly grapple with the impact of a non-affirming theological position on their lives, the crushing burdens, and the double standards that it places on their shoulders. But while those sorts of human failings are certainly a significant factor behind opposition to LGBTQ inclusion in the church, they aren't the full picture. For many non-affirming Christians, even once they have grown in awareness and compassion for the suffering of LGBTQ people in the church, they continue to have doubts and concerns about reconsidering their theology for reasons that we can and should take seriously, and that if we do, we can help to address. In my experience, the primary concern of most non-affirming Christians in this conversation has long been about the authority of the Bible. In the church that I grew up in, the only LGBTQ affirming Christians that most people had ever even heard of came to their conclusions by, in one way or another, taking a lower view of the Bible's authority. Sure, Paul may have said that, people heard from theological progressives in our denomination, but Paul was just a man of his times, and on this, he was wrong. Or, yes, some would say, the Bible is inspired in a very general sense, but Parts of it are less inspired. And the parts about sexuality are largely outdated and irrelevant now. When that's the way that this conversation is framed, there really is no conversation. From the standpoint of non-affirming Christians, this then becomes no longer about how we interpret scripture, but about whether we are even committed to scripture as our authority over and above our experiences when it comes to shaping our beliefs about truth and morality. If we aren't, then changing our minds about LGBTQ inclusion will almost inevitably erode our faith foundations and call into question other, much more central parts of our faith. I have always taken that concern seriously. And that's why my case from the beginning has been not just that Christians should affirm same-sex relationships and transgender people. More specifically, my argument has been that Christians can and should become affirming while continuing to affirm and uphold the authority of the Bible as the word of God. I've made that case in detail over the years, 
and I remain convinced that it is sound based on the biblical texts themselves. That said, though, it's one thing to come to that conclusion intellectually and theologically, but it's another to see that conclusion actually lived out or not lived out in a community. And this is where we come to one of the major current challenges in this conversation. Even if something is true, if the community that's around us doesn't believe that it's true, our confidence in it can be undermined. The sad irony here is that the slippery slope fears of many non-affirming Christians can sometimes become a self-fulfilling prophecy. The fear that becoming affirming will lead to a broader unraveling of one's Christian faith is itself a major factor behind the severity of many non-affirming churches' responses when someone comes out or when someone simply changes their mind and becomes affirming. And the intensity of that sort of rejection and ostracism can itself be deeply damaging to people's faith, even when becoming affirming wasn't. Consequently, if someone comes out, is kicked out by their church, and then loses their faith, the church can easily misdiagnose the problem by assuming that becoming affirming was what led to their loss of faith, when in reality, the real driving force behind that was the subsequent rejection they experienced from other Christians. This misdiagnosis can then create a vicious cycle in which churches double down on the primary thing that's fueling the problem they're trying to avoid. And that response tends to drive more of a wedge between people and their faith, leading many LGBTQ Christians, as well as allies who've experienced rejection after becoming affirming, to feel spiritually homeless. This homelessness is often experienced, at least in part, as a crisis of authority. If my church and its leadership were wrong about this, what else might they have been wrong about? If it isn't true that same-sex relationships are sinful, what else that I've been taught was true isn't? And who can I look to as a guide to help me figure that out? What's more, all of those questions don't take place in a vacuum. That experience of alienation is difficult to undergo at any time, but it's been even harder in the last few years, as so many of us who've grown up in the evangelical church have had additional reasons to lose confidence and trust in many of those who played a formative role in nurturing our faith. Flagrant hypocrisy and the pursuit of power at seemingly any cost have damaged the church's witness and felt like a betrayal for many of us who've watched as the Jesus we invited into our hearts as children has too often been reduced to a team mascot in our increasingly ugly and mean-spirited culture wars. If the people who introduced me to Jesus can live in such contradictory ways to the values they once taught me, it's natural for many to ask, how much of this was ever true in the first place? How much of what I was taught about Christianity is actually real? And how much of it should I still believe? The term that's now widely used for those who are going through this sort of extensive questioning of what they'd once been taught about their faith is deconstruction. For many of us, this is an unavoidable process once we come to believe that any significant aspect of the theology and beliefs that we were taught growing up isn't true. That could be about same-sex relationships, but it could also be about the role of women in the church, about questions of science, or about whether Christians all need to vote for the same political party. <laughs> but whatever the impetus for it, or the term that's used to describe it, this process is one that millions of people today, and especially millions of younger people in the church, have gone through or are going through. And that reality, and how widespread it is, can provoke different responses, including responses that I think err in two different directions. On the one hand, seeing deconstruction lead to a loss of faith for many can lead to a fearful or condemning response from some in the church who would prefer to interpret this phenomenon as merely people falling away from the faith because of the attractions of sin and cultural relevance in an increasingly secular and post-Christian society. But that sort of perspective overlooks the many real problems in the church that are pushing people away. Rethinking beliefs and attitudes that aren't true or that aren't faithful to Jesus and to scripture isn't a bad thing. It's a healthy and necessary thing, and it can help to make the church better. But at the same time, 
just as deconstruction shouldn't be uncritically dismissed or condemned. It also isn't something that should be uncritically praised regardless of what beliefs someone is deconstructing or what measuring stick they're using to judge what's true and what's not in the process. As Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do everything, but not everything is constructive. If deconstruction is pursued in an overly reactive way, then it can easily lead to a whiplash-inducing rush to embrace the opposite of whatever beliefs someone started with. And that almost inevitably involves sweeping away some beliefs that are good and true, along with those that are flawed the proverbial baby with the bathwater. And even when someone seeks to maintain a Christian identity, this highly reactive approach is usually unsustainable. The celibate gay Catholic writer Eve Tushnet has written of the insufficiency of what she calls a vocation of no when it comes to church teaching for gay people. You can't have a vocation of not gay marrying and not having sex, she said. You can't have a vocation of no. That principle is just as true for our faith as it is for how we live our lives. If all that someone has clarity on anymore is the things that they don't believe, or the things that more conservative Christians believe, say, or do that they oppose, then they don't actually have anything firm to stand on. Identifying things that are wrong is important. In fact, it's critical but there are real shortcomings to merely naming the areas where many conservative Christians are wrong, declaring the opposite positions on those issues, and then reorienting one's faith identity in order to create as much distance as possible from those problems by, for instance, trading out the label conservative Christian for progressive Christian. If our identity is based principally or even significantly on the things that we don't believe, then over time, it will crumble. We need a foundation not of sand, but of rock. We need to identify what is right and true in Christianity, not just what is wrong. And as Christians today, we are the beneficiaries of a 2,000-year-old faith. Church tradition is not infallible, of course, but it gives us a rich well of resources to draw from when we are undergoing shifts in our faith. We don't have to simply swing from side to side, running as far in the opposite direction as possible. We can instead press deeper, going to the roots of our faith to find solid anchors to hold on to in the midst of change. One of the most important anchors in all of the Bible is found in the opening verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This chapter is famous for Paul's impassioned argument about the literal, about the literal physical reality of Christ's resurrection. If Christ has not been raised, he wrote in verse 14, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. We'll come back to this part of the chapter, but it's before that, specifically verses 3 through 5, that's arguably the most significant part of this entire letter. Here, Paul explicitly describes what the gospel, the good news, is. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5, he says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. So the gospel, Paul says here, is simply this, that Jesus died for our sins, that he was raised from the dead, that he was seen by many people after his resurrection, and so we have good reason to believe that he really was resurrected, and that all of this took place in accordance with the scriptures. This passage from 1 Corinthians 15 takes on even greater weight because there is wide agreement among biblical scholars across the ideological spectrum that verses 3 through 5 were not original to Paul, 
but were instead a very early oral creed among followers of Jesus that Paul was quoting, and a creed that can be dated to within just a few years of Jesus' death. In his book, How Jesus Became God, Bart Ehrman, an agnostic biblical scholar, has written of these verses that, quote, it is believed far and wide among New Testament specialists that Paul is indicating that this is a tradition already widespread in the Christian church, handed over to him by Christian teachers, possibly even the earlier apostles themselves. Ehrman writes that it is a very tightly formulated creedal statement that is brilliantly structured. That formulaic structure can be more clearly seen when the component parts of the verses are displayed in parallel. That Christ died for our sins is the opening statement of faith, followed by an appeal to scripture, according to the scriptures, followed by evidence for the claim that he was buried. Then, that he was raised on the third day is the parallel statement of faith, followed by another appeal to scripture, according to the scriptures followed by evidence for that claim, that he was seen by Cephas, referring to Peter, and then by the Twelve. As N.T. Wright has written in his book, The Resurrection of the Son of God, this is the kind of foundation story with which a community is not at liberty to tamper. It was probably formulated within the first two or three years after Easter itself, since it was already in formulaic form when Paul received it. New Testament scholar James Dunn agreed, writing in his book, Jesus Remembered, that, quote, this tradition, we can be entirely confident, was formulated as tradition within months of Jesus' death. It's worth taking some time to reflect on what this means. From the very beginning, Christians have believed that Jesus died for our sins and that he was raised from the dead. As people are going through the process of systematically questioning the beliefs they were raised with, it's not uncommon for people to wonder about the nature and purpose of Jesus' death. Did he really die for our sins, or was that merely a later interpretation? Christians have indeed long debated and disagreed about the details and the mechanics of the atonement, how Jesus' death atoned for our sins and reconciled us to God. But the fact of the atonement itself, the reality that we were dead in our sins, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us and for our sins to reconcile us to God. That reality has always been a basic, essential component of the Christian faith. In her book, The Crucifixion, Episcopal theologian Fleming Rutledge writes that it is a grave mistake, quote, to ignore, disparage, or dismiss the clear statement of the New Testament that Jesus died for sin. The connection between the crucifixion and sin is permanently and emphatically fixed in the biblical text, she writes. And unless we are to abandon the New Testament witness altogether, we must acknowledge that the overcoming of sin lies at the very heart of the meaning of the crucifixion. So, Jesus died for our sins. The other key belief included in the creedal statement of 1 Corinthians 15, 3-5 is Jesus' resurrection. He was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. This is, of course, the single most important claim of the Christian faith, without which there would be no Christian faith. And it's Paul's primary focus throughout 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ has not been raised, Paul says in verse 17, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, he adds in verse 19, we are of all people most to be pitied. The claim that Jesus died, was buried, and then came back to life on the third day is, it should go without saying, a radical one. It isn't easy for many people in modern societies to accept, and so there are occasionally attempts to water it down to something easier to swallow. The resurrection as metaphor, rather than as literal fact the imaginative creation of an ancient, pre-scientific people. But while we should certainly have grace for doubt, we cannot abandon the historic Christian belief in the literal bodily resurrection of Jesus without effectively abandoning Christianity altogether. The resurrection of Jesus isn't just an idle, abstract debate 
for theologians that has no real impact on our day-to-day lives. If it really happened, then it is the very hinge point of human history. And it fundamentally transforms our understanding of the world. Whether Jesus was actually raised from the dead determines whether death has actually been defeated. Whether we too can place our hope in a future resurrection. And whether evil and sin will have the last word in our world where they so often seem to reign unchecked. Whether Jesus was raised from the dead is ultimately about whether good wins over evil in the end. So there's a reason why the resurrection of Jesus was included in the earliest Christian oral creeds. The Christian faith is based on the resurrection because our hope as Christians does not exist without the resurrection. Amidst all the things that people are questioning and reevaluating today, including things that are worth reevaluating, this one shouldn't be up for grabs. Christ's resurrection is part of our foundation of rock. It's the earliest distinctively Christian belief, and it's one that we can and should continue to confidently proclaim. So then, the good news, as Paul defines it in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5, is Christ's atoning death and his bodily resurrection, that Jesus died for our sins, and that he was raised from the dead. But as foundational as those things are, they aren't the only beliefs that are core to Christianity, or the only beliefs that have a very early attestation. Another early creed in the New Testament, in Philippians, affirms Christ's divinity and incarnation. Philippians 2, 6 and 7 tell us that although Jesus was in very nature God, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And by the second century, many church fathers, including Irenaeus, Tertullian, Origen, and Clement of Alexandria, wrote about what they called, in Latin, the regula fidei, or the rule of faith an outline of basic Christian beliefs. In his book, Christianity at the Crossroads, New Testament scholar Michael Kruger summarized the early rule of faith based on the writings of the church fathers as follows. Number one, there is one God, the creator of heaven and earth. Number two, this same God spoke through the prophets of the Old Testament regarding the coming Messiah. Number three, Jesus is the son of God born from the seed of David, through the Virgin Mary. Number four, Jesus is the creator of all things, who came into the world, God in the flesh. Number five, Jesus came to bring salvation and redemption for those who believe in him. Number six, Jesus physically suffered and was crucified under Pontius Pilate, raised bodily from the dead, and exalted to the right hand of God the Father. And number seven, Jesus will return again to judge the world. These statements of belief aren't just a list of doctrines. As Kruger writes, they are a history of redemption, less about raw doctrinal truths and more about affirming divine actions in history. They summarize the whole arc of the Bible, focusing on what God has accomplished through Jesus. And they show us the faith beliefs that were considered essential by early Christians, even before the development of official written creeds. The two most famous creeds that were later developed, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, have much in common with the rule of faith. The Apostles' Creed in particular is arguably the most universal expression of Christian belief throughout history and throughout the world today. So when we find ourselves questioning how much of what we learned growing up is really true, and whether certain things we were taught were more rooted in culture than in scripture, it's helpful to remember that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. The early creeds give us a summary and a baseline that long predates our own time. I invite you to join me in reading the Apostles' Creed. It states, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living 
and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. There is some debate about the line, he descended to the dead in the Apostles' Creed, also often rendered as he descended into hell. But overall, the Apostles' Creed provides a foundational statement of Christian belief that we can and should continue to affirm today. It is Trinitarian in its structure, and at the Council of Nicaea in the year 325, and then at the Council of Constantinople in 381, the Nicene Creed was developed to more formally work out the doctrine of the Trinity. God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons in one substance, Jesus being true God from true God. The Nicene Creed reads, and I invite you to read this as well, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So then, the beliefs that form the very heart of the Christian faith are these. God as three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus as fully human and fully divine. Jesus' death for our sins and his resurrection from the dead. That is the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And it is a solid rock on which we can stand even when we feel bruised by and disillusioned with the shortcomings of Christians and churches today. Now, let's take a step back for a moment to note simply this. Nothing in those core beliefs is about marriage or sexuality. It's not that those topics aren't important, but they don't rise to the level of first-order theological beliefs for Christians. They are secondary theological issues, and Christians can disagree about them while still remaining firmly committed to the heart of the historic Orthodox Christian faith. That observation, it's worth noting, that marriage and sexuality are not creedal issues, sometimes elicits skeptical responses in one of two directions. On the one hand, more conservative-leaning Christians rightly note that no ethical issues are mentioned in the creeds, but surely that doesn't mean that faithful Christians are then free to live however they want as a result. And in a similar vein, some more progressive-leaning Christians also take issue with a focus on the creeds because of the absence of ethical teachings in them. But their concern tends to focus less on personal holiness and more on doing justice and loving our neighbors. Isn't the way we treat people, some understandably ask, more important than what we believe? Shouldn't faith be more than just giving intellectual assent to a set of doctrinal propositions? Certainly, James would agree that faith without works is dead. So if all one's faith is, is cognitive agreement with a list of beliefs, then something has gone seriously wrong. That sort of faith has simply short-circuited. But part of the beauty and the power of the creedal formulas in scripture and of formal creeds like the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed 
is that if we truly believe what they say, then we cannot help but to fundamentally reorient everything in our lives around them. If, for example, we believe that there is one God who is the creator of heaven and earth, then we will resist the temptation to make idols out of other things and put them above God. If we believe that Jesus himself was God in the flesh, then we won't just take his ethical teachings seriously. We will change everything about our lives to seek to live out his commandments, and particularly the two commandments that he called the greatest, to love God with all our hearts, souls, and minds, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. We will take scripture incredibly seriously because Jesus taught in John 10, 35, that scripture cannot be set aside. And we will do our best to faithfully interpret and apply the Bible's teachings today and to live our lives in humble obedience to them. So the beliefs in the creeds give us some natural guardrails when it comes to ethical discernment. The area of ethics is certainly not a free-for-all for Christians. And that includes questions about how we faithfully steward our sexuality. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul grounds his argument against prostitution in our future hope of resurrection, emphasizing that what we do with our bodies matters because God will one day raise our bodies from the dead too, and that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. To be clear, Paul's point here is not that the consequences of sexual sins will somehow endure into the resurrection. Rather, his point is to underscore that sexuality is not a matter of moral indifference, because the body was created by God with profound significance and because the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in our bodies. So if we believe in the resurrection of the body as the creed state, then that, along with Jesus' own teachings about lust, adultery, and covenantal faithfulness, will shape our view of sexual ethics. It doesn't resolve all differences among Christians on issues of sexuality, but it does narrow the range of possibilities, excluding things like prostitution, promiscuity, and lustful self-seeking as valid options for followers of Jesus. That basic idea of seeking to honor God with our bodies is why my case from the beginning has never been about dismantling the historic Christian sexual ethic, but rather about grafting LGBTQ people into the heart of it. Non-affirming Christians sometimes express the concern that affirming same-sex marriage is merely the fruit of our society's idolatry of individual desire. Because I desire something, the idea goes, then as long as I have consent and am not hurting anyone else, my freedom requires no constraints on my ability to satisfy that desire. Certainly, with the ease of access to countless different viewpoints online, it's not hard to find people promoting the idea that true liberation requires being able to have sex with whomever you want, whenever you want, as long as the other person or people consent. But while those views do exist and have long existed in various quarters, that is not the case that the vast majority of affirming Christians in the church today are making. There have indeed been many important critiques in recent years of the movement known as purity culture, which taught not just that sex should be for marriage, but that if someone had sex outside of marriage, which the vast majority of people do at least at some point, then they would be damaged goods for the rest of their lives. These sorts of messages were and are deeply harmful, and the legalism and shaming that were all too common in the purity culture movement have no doubt contributed to the increasing rejection of Christian sexual ethics across the board in our society today. We can and should reject fear and shame-based approaches to teaching about sexuality, but we can do that while continuing to honor and affirm the rich wisdom that the Bible and the Christian tradition have to offer us. By keeping in mind the teaching of Ephesians that marriage is intended to reflect Christ's self-giving love for the church, we can see our sexuality, regardless of our orientation, as primarily a gift given not for individual satisfaction, but for mutual sanctification, for growing more into Christ's image in us through our self-giving love for our spouse. So a Christian embrace of same-sex marriage then doesn't need to be premised on the logic of hyper-individualism and consumerism. Instead, it can be rooted in our core beliefs about who God is and what God has done for us through Jesus. Christians can and should affirm monogamous, covenantal same-sex relationships 
not because of cultural trends, but because they reflect and witness to the sacrificial love of Christ for his church, which itself is the ultimate reflection of the covenantal, self-giving nature of God. And our core beliefs about God and Jesus don't just lead us to a distinctly Christian affirmation of LGBTQ people and relationships. They also have a profound effect on shaping how we interact with and treat others in the church who disagree with us. Part of the reason why I have long been passionate about changing hearts and minds in the church on this topic is because I am convicted that this is a matter of justice and injustice and of life and death. But being a follower of Jesus changes our approach to pursuing justice. If one major problem in the church today is the pursuit of purity without grace, then a major problem in our society is the pursuit of justice without mercy. An all too common mindset is that if someone is on the wrong side of a justice issue, then normal rules of kindness and love don't apply, especially if you yourself are directly affected by that person's stance. Shaming, mocking, and bullying can all be justified in the name of justice. And it can be all too easy and all too satisfying to view ourselves as on the side of the angels and those who disagree with us as, at best, our enemies, and at worst, monsters. But from a Christian perspective, none of that will do. Non-affirming Christians are not our enemies. They are our family. They too have been adopted as children of God through Christ. And we are in no position to judge or look down on them morally. Christ died for all of our sins, and we were in no less need of the reconciliation to God that his death and resurrection affected than anyone else. We all stand equally at the foot of the cross, where there is no place for self-righteousness, only the humble acceptance of God's sacrificial love for us. And while the pursuit of justice and the correcting of injustice is a necessary outworking of our faith, we have to remember what scripture commands about justice. What does the Lord require of you? Micah 6, 8 asks. To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Do justice and love mercy. Do justice and walk humbly. For the people of God, justice cannot be separated from mercy and humility. In many ways, that is a radical and countercultural claim today. But it's not accidental or optional. It's the only way we can live if we have truly internalized the mercy and grace we have been shown by God. That is why what we believe about God matters. It's not a mere academic exercise. It changes everything about how we live our lives and how we treat other people. And that's why it matters that we practice discernment in seasons of change and hold tightly to the heart of our faith, which has always been good and true. Fleming Rutledge, the Episcopal theologian I quoted earlier, has cautioned against what she calls the indiscriminate passion of the convert who has pruned away so much of the plant that he has killed it. The plant does need pruning, and the church needs reform, but it doesn't need a revolution. We don't need to burn it down and start over. The heart of our faith is true. It is true that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. It is true that he lived a sinless life, showing us the way to live. It is true that he died for our sins, offering us reconciliation with God. It is true that he was raised from the dead on the third day, and that he will come again in glory and power to make all things new. And the Bible truly testifies to all these things and can be trusted as the inspired and authoritative word of God. But what is not true is the message of condemnation and rejection of LGBTQ people that remains so widespread. It is not true that all same-sex relationships are morally wrong. It is not true that it is somehow sinful or wrong to be transgender or intersex. It is not true that the only path of faithfulness for gay Christians is lifelong singleness and celibacy. And it is not true that the Bible, properly understood and applied, teaches those things. And tragically, those false beliefs are clouding the true ones 
for so many people today. The mixture of truth and falsehood is always a dangerous one, but that's all the more the case when falsehoods are mixed in with the most important truths that there are. For so many today, especially for the youngest generations, non-affirming theology effectively acts as a poison pill in the message of the gospel, not because it is not popular, and not because it asks too much, but because it is not true. So why, some wonder, keep laboring to change an institution that has said it doesn't want you, and where you will inevitably find yourself at times bruised and wounded by fear, ignorance, and prejudice? Why? Because if Jesus died for our sins, and if he rose from the dead, if he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, if he was God made man, then he is worth everything. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our praise. And he is worthy of taking up our cross to follow. When Christ calls a man, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, he bids him come and die. In Christ, we die to our old selves. We die to the ways of the world. We die to our obsessions with comfort, safety, and popularity. But in Christ, we are also in union with the great physician who heals our souls and whose healing every inch of creation desperately needs and is groaning for. Come and die, yes. And also, come and live. Jesus is the life. He is the way. He is the truth. The truth of the gospel is simply too precious to let go of because, what if, because of what is wrong in the church. And as affirming Christians, we have a unique opportunity and a unique call to, with mercy and humility, help correct this grave error in the church today by changing hearts and minds and then policies and teachings to fully graft in LGBTQ people into the body where they have always belonged. And at the same time, and above all, we must keep our eyes firmly fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who is eternally worthy, and who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Prune the plant, but do not kill it. Remove the bushel to let the light of our faith shine. That is our mission. And that is our calling. Thank you.